poured out for Jesus. We were reminded by our responsive reading this morning that Paul's salvation was completely unexpected and unsolicited. He had no interest in Christ. He was not seeking to be saved. In fact, he hated Jesus and was out to imprison and kill his followers. But God intervened, even as he does to this day, changing servants of sin, self and Satan, into children of God by faith in Jesus. After Paul was converted, Jesus revealed to him that he would spend his days suffering for preaching Christ and him crucified for sinners. And so from that day forward, Paul was ready to suffer and die for Jesus, saying in Philippians 1.20 that my earnest expectation and hope is that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In Acts chapter 21, verses 10 through 14, we see an example of how God let Paul know what suffering he might have to endure. It's quite a specific revelation. Acts 21.10, as we, that is, Paul and his companions were staying there in Philip's house for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when he had heard this, when we had heard this, we as well as the local residents began begging Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, what are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent remarking the will of the Lord be done. The promise of Christ or of suffering for Christ's sake is a reality for all the followers of Jesus. You might remember the words of 2 Timothy 3, 10 through 14, where Paul says this. This is 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. And Paul says, Now you, Timothy, followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, he says, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, he adds, all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. Therefore, as Christians, living, speaking, and standing for God, we mustn't be surprised when the world treats us not just with contempt, but also with violence at times. The prophets of old, Jesus, the disciples, and the apostles, in addition, the millions of martyrs who have been slaughtered for the name of Christ, these all bear witness to the truth that all who live godly in Christ will suffer. Take a stand for Jesus in your family, in your workplace or uh, wherever uh, it might be, and there will be repercussions. Last Lord's Day, we worked our way through 2 Timothy 4 in the first five verses, where Paul describes an ever-increasing dislike of the gospel that will intensify year by year till our Lord's return. But, says Paul, <coughs> uh, uh, Timothy must not change his message. Look at verse 5, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 5. You, he says, after going down this, this list of the tragic things that are going to unfold, people throwing out good teachers of uh, the word of God and bringing in people who won't say hard things to them, just tickle their ears and say, you're okay, I'm okay, we had a, a lady many, many years ago. They were here for a little while, and 
And she said to me on the way out one day, so we won't be back. When I go to church, I want to be made to feel good. Well, uh, there are people here that feel good even when the scriptures get a piece of them. Amen. We love that. Yes. It's called growth in grace and knowledge. Amen. It's a challenge to the things that are out of place in our lives and dishonor the, the Lord and indeed cause us a great deal of grief uh, from a, on a day-to-day uh, basis. You be sober in all things, endure hardship, and do the work of an evangelist, and thereby you will fulfill your ministry. In other words, keep preaching the gospel once for all delivered to the saints. And now Paul speaks of his personal and impending death. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6. For I am ready to be poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I have kept the faith, and in the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. A reward waiting for us. So let's look at these statements individually. First of all, in verse 6, we have this, this uh, a sentence, I am being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Now we know that Paul is about to be beheaded for his faith, but he doesn't say, I am about to die. He says, I'm about to offer my life as a drink offering to God. According to Numbers 15, verses 1 through 10, which I will help you if you'll read that this afternoon and help you with understanding of the, the, uh, the lesson today. According to that text, when a lamb was sacrificed, a drink offering had to be offered as well, consisting of about a gallon of wine. It was to be gradually poured out beside the altar as a final act in the sacrificial ceremony. Here, Paul uses it as a metaphor of his life being gradually spent in service of Christ and those Christ came to save. For the moment, uh, from the moment of his conversion, Paul considered himself to be a, a living sacrifice to God. And now his cup of life would be emptied for the Savior he loved. The time of his departure had arrived. Now, secondly, and in verse 7, he says this, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Now, as I read this, I prayed out loud, O oh Lord in heaven, may I be able to say, make these claims when the last drop pours from my life's cup. O oh God, make it so for me. Wouldn't that be grand? to finish our race, to come to our last breath and have the, that peace in our hearts that we had done our best to serve the Lord in an honorable fashion, uh, fighting against sin and reaching toward holiness of living uh, all of our days. Well, this is what Paul has to say. I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I have kept the faith. William Hendrickson, a trusted friend now gone to be with the Lord, tells us what this good fight consisted of for Paul. You'll recognize it. His fight had been against Satan, against the principalities and powers, the world rulers of this darkness in the heavenlies, against Jewish and pagan vice and, and violence, against Judaism uh, among the Galatians, against fanaticism among the Thessalonians, against uh, contention, fornication, and litigation among the Corinthians and against Gnosticism among the Ephesians and the Colossians, against fighting without and fears within, and last but not least, against the law of sin and death operating in his own heart. What's your greatest struggle? Is it the people out there or is it the person in here? Your greatest struggle. Indeed, 
The war is great. And so we, Paul says, I, I have fought against all the enemies, the, the enemy within me and the enemies without. I have fought them all my days as you have instructed me to do. Such battles are the Christian's daily experience, and it is a good fight, for the rewards are great and eternal. To put down the flesh day by day and hour by hour for the glory of God is a good thing, albeit a hard thing to do. Apart from the grace of God, you won't make it. You must first be born again by fleeing to Christ He'll give you a new heart and a new mind, a longing for holiness, a hatred of sin that you've never had before, and you'll be on your way, living for the Lord and fighting this good fight against wickedness within and without. To fight against the evil one with the armor of God is to fight for truth, holiness, peace, joy, and a good testimony before men. Of course, Ephesians 6, 10 and following comes to mind, doesn't it? put on the whole armor of God. Again, I, I read these things and I pray, oh God, when I come to the end of my life, may I in truth say I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course you ordained for me. Now you who have or do play golf understand that there is a predetermined path you walk as you make your way through the course. Likewise, there is only one way in and out of a maze. Uh, you've got to stay on the path laid out by the designer if you hope to find the exit in the end. There is also a course or a path laid out for the people of God to walk in as they make their way through this life on their way to glory. The Christian does not live a life of chance encounters. There is no such thing in God's economy as good and bad luck. Rather, God has determined whatsoever comes to pass. Psalm 139 tells us that God created every one of us in our mother's womb, designed exclusively, individually, and specially by God as we must be. He made us exactly like he wanted us to be and then ordered the days of our lives as concerns the number of them as well as the content of them. This is a, there is a course laid out for each of us, a step-by-step -step path that we will walk for God's plans cannot be overthrown. Have you ever noticed uh, some severe resistance in your life? when you really want to do something and it's just not working out, no matter which direction you take, you, you, you just go this way, drive 100 miles around the corner, and you try to attack this thing from the, from the rear, but it's not going to work there either. God is so kind and good to us, even to people who uh, don't honor him with their lives. He has a course laid out for every single human being and particularly for Christians. And his plans can't be overthrown. You might remember the following text from last week out of Acts 17 and verse 26, where we read, Paul is speaking to a bunch of idolaters, uh, Greek uh, idol worshipers, and he's telling them about the one true God. They have many idols to many so-called gods, and he says, I want to tell you about the one you don't know yet. And he says, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. You ready? Having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Amen. Yeah, the boundaries of their habitation. You ever had a, a youngster say, I didn't ask to be born? I didn't, I didn't choose you as parents? I hate this house? I don't like your rules? Well, it might not be good to say in the heat of the battle, but when they calm down, you've got to somehow make them know that you're exactly the parents God gave them and that this is where you're supposed to be right now under the influence and authority of these 
flawed people. There's another text in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, that I discovered very, very early on in my Christian life. Came across it, had it marked, had it memorized. Uh, shortly after I was converted, I couldn't believe that this was in this Bible that was brand new to me. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Yeah, praise God for that. Surely tried to get rid of me for years and God wouldn't let it happen. Huh? Died her best to run me off. And I just kept coming like a bulldog. <laughs> the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. And then I, in Isaiah 46, 9, we read this. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the end from the beginning. I am the one who says how this is going to unfold. And that and that and that. Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it and surely I will do it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a comfortable place to live in the care of, of an utterly sovereign God. And so our ancient brother is not bragging when he makes these claims, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. Rather, he is declaring what God in grace has accomplished through and for him, the chief of sinners. Now what does Paul mean when he says, I have kept the faith? Well, the word kept means to guard, keep in custody, preserve, and watch over. And Paul has done exactly that. He used his life up in the proclamation and preservation of the Christian gospel, doing everything necessary to see that it was passed from one generation to the other without any additions or deletions. Very careful. In this sense, Paul kept the faith. Or perhaps he is saying... Or maybe, in addition, he is saying, I have retained my personal trust in God, my confidence in all his Christ-centered promises. In the spiritual arena of life, I have not only fought hard and run well, but I have also been sustained to the end by the deeply rooted conviction that I shall receive the prize, the glorious reward. Therefore, he says in 2 Timothy 4.8, in the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Who doesn't want a crown of righteousness? Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me and to other people like me who long to see the second coming of Jesus. And so it's not just the great apostle Paul, but all the people of God, everyone waiting for the coming of the Savior who will receive the crown of righteousness. And the question is, I suppose at this point, is do you love and long for the appearing of Jesus? Do you strain your neck toward the horizon hoping to catch a glimpse of his coming glory? Now there's got to be mixed answers to that question in this little gathering. If you know something about God's truth, about righteousness, sin, judgment, heaven, and hell, you might not want to see Jesus coming over the horizon uh, to judge the living and the dead. But if you are a believer in Jesus, resting your entire eternity in his finished work upon the cross where he paid for all the sins of all humanity who come to him by faith in Jesus Christ, if you are one of those, then you just might be craning your neck looking for and praying that God would hurry up 
and bring the Lord Jesus back to earth? If so, the promised reward belongs to you. If you love his appearing, only God can make that happen, you see. That's, a, that's part of the fruit of, of rebirth. When a person is born again, when they become a Christian, there is nothing they would love more than to meet Jesus face to face, to see him as he is, and to be made righteous in his presence, completely so. In John 3, 2, we find some information showing us um, how coming to love Jesus as Savior and Lord changes our lives completely. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, where he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be, You've thought about that, haven't you? What's, what's my heavenly person going to be like? Will I be changed so completely that no one will know who John Skaggs is? I tell my wife that uh, quite often. I say, you, you've never known a perfect me, and so I, I doubt we'll even, I won't know who you are, and you won't know who I am. Yeah, a lot of people think differently about that. I, I'm not fixed on it. I just, I just wonder, how, how in the world is that going to work? Now we are the children of God has not appeared yet, as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, can you stand it? We'll be like him? Really? Yeah. God tells us that right here. It's right in front of our eyes. You can't deny it. When he appears, we'll be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself. You see, if you long for the coming of Christ, it means God's given you a new heart. You're not connected to this this world and this this world is not your home. You are now a pilgrim passing through on your way to glory. Your connections are being severed more and more as concerns this world. And everyone who has this hope of seeing Jesus come to gather them up and take them to heaven lives a purified life on earth. Means, meaning they fight sin, they do the same things. Uh, what did it say? Um, what was the, the battle? Let me see if I can spot that paragraph again. His fight was against Satan, against the principalities, power, world, rulers of darkness in the heavenlies, against Jewish and pagan vice and violence, um, and against the, the monsters in his own heart, it goes on. If you have the hope of seeing Jesus, if you're born again, if you're a believer in Christ, there are many days when you've had enough of this world and enough of yourself right we were listening to a, a, one of our favorite preachers this morning he said many years ago a man knocked on his doors on his door in Scotland and and he answered the door in his bathrobe and the guy says give it to me what and he says what do you want he says give it to me I don't know how you got it, but you got my diary. You know every cotton-picking thing about me. Now I want my book back. And all he was doing was preaching from the Bible. God knew every cotton-picking thing about him and was revealing his knowledge and convicting him of sin. I haven't had that at my door yet. That would be fun, maybe. Unless he was a mean guy. <clears throat> well, so <clears throat> everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin or continues to practice sin because God's seed, that is the Holy Spirit, lives in him and he can't continue practicing sin like he once did because he is born of God. 
By this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Any person who claims to be a Christian and does not practice righteousness like a three-year-old trying to learn a bicycle on his nose, back on, training wheels, pushing uh, scabs and blood, uh, practicing living for the Lord. And if you don't love the people of God, the house of God, the word of God, all these things indicate that you haven't been born again. You haven't fled to Christ to confess your sin, repent of your sin, and declare your faith in Jesus for salvation. And so when one is born again by believing in Jesus, he or she gets a new heart. They're always making war against sin, self, and the evil one. The believer is always purifying himself by putting off everything offensive to God and putting on that which pleases him. All such persons will receive the crown of righteousness, the same crown Paul speaks of in our text. I read it again. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Can you imagine that? Don't we think of the Apostle Paul as some kind of superhero? He's the Apostle Paul. Wrote more than half of the New Testament. Healed the sick, raised the dead. The great Apostle Paul, he says, no, no. Your reward's the same as mine. Huh? Crown of righteousness, not only for me, but to all who have loved his appearing. This crown is not said to be earned, but that it is laid up for us by God and by Christ who earned it for us. The rewards promised are all the result of Christ earning them for us and giving them to us by grace through faith in him. We will be rewarded on the same basis we were saved, the righteousness of Christ given to us when we believed. All our acceptance with God is by grace. Titus 3.5 says this, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Boy, if that, that's a mouthful, isn't it? He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done. Do you understand that? You've got to understand that. If you think you need to clean yourself up before you can run to Jesus, you're on the wrong trail. There is no salvation in cleaning yourself up. You can't clean yourself up. Sin stains are indelible except by the scrubbing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. He can wash a sinner clean and him alone. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done. What you've done won't keep you out of the kingdom if you cry out for mercy. What you've done won't get you in the kingdom if you've been the best human being any human can be. That's not how people are saved. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus, through Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made what? Heirs. Heirs of who? Wouldn't you love to be one of my heirs? That should be a resounding no. You ain't got nothing to leave behind. This is an heir of God. An heir of God and our brother Jesus Christ. Being justified by his grace, and we have been made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Our inheritance is reserved in heaven for us, and it is imperishable. 
James 1, 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, that is, kept the faith to his last breath, he will receive the crown of life which, is, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There's that crown of life, crown of righteousness. 1 Peter 5, 4, And when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Crown of glory. That's, that's exciting. What are we going to do with those crowns when we get them and when we get to heaven? Somebody? Cast them at the feet of Jesus. Throw them down. Standing in the presence of the Holy of Holies, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the God who made all things, formed us in our mother's womb, saved us from our sins, rose from the dead, and went to glory to build us a house. Mansions in glory. I go, he says, I'm going to build you a place to live, and I'll come again and get you. Second coming of Jesus. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And then there's Revelation 2.8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Friend, you got Jesus? You own the cattle on a thousand hills. You are rich beyond measure. I know your poverty and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil's about to cast some of you into prison. Now wait a minute. Could our society produce this in our time? Could indeed. Could indeed. There are a lot of God-haters out there, and if there are God-haters, there are God-worshipper-haters. Don't like us one bit. Behold, the devil's about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested, and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. How about 1 Corinthians 9, 24? Do you not know that those who run in a race all run but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control. I wish it didn't say that. How about you, Miss Loose Lip? <laughs> Mr. Straying Eyeball? Mr. Anger? Mr. Covetousness, mm, self-control. That's a gift from God. You know that, don't you? That's a gift from God. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They, meaning earthly Olympians, then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, an imperishable, we run the course. We stay on track. No deviation. 2 Timothy 4.8 There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but, all to, but also to all who have loved his appearing. One final, final text in Revelation. Behold, I am coming quickly. If that makes you nervous, then quickly flee to Christ. Quickly repent of your sin. Let go of all in your life that you know must be cast off. And embrace the pleading Savior. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the gates into the city. Wash your robes in the blood of Jesus. That is the only place, only way you can be cleansed. 
Outside of the kingdom are the dogs and sorcerers and immoral persons and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bride and morning star. Now listen, the spirit and the bride say come. Who are they, who are they talking to? They're talking to us. They're talking to you personally. The Spirit and the Bride say come. The Holy Spirit and the Church of Jesus Christ says come. And let the one who hears say come. When a person has been converted, that's what he begins to do, isn't it? He says, come see what I've found. Come see the Savior. I have met him and he's changed my life completely. Come see. Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes Take the water of life without cost. <clears throat>